Hey everybody, it's Randy with Master Books, and I'm here with Kristen to discuss the math uh, <laughs> language discuss lessons for a living education. <laughs> language lessons for a living education, and uh, we had some technical difficulties now, and I wasn't even part of that video. So now the technical difficulties will all be focused straight here. So, okay. <laughs> uh, We're a little off today with all the chaos going on in our life right now. Yeah. It's a funny story. We just celebrated 29 years of marriage. That's we a had funny a, story? It was a funny story. <laughs> we had our anniversary weekend. We, we were out and about. And the instructions kept saying, turn right here. <laughs> and I kept looking for the left-hand turns and realized I need some remedial training because I missed two right-hand turns. Anyways, okay. So we're live with Kristen talking about language lessons for a living education. And um, with that, I'm going to let her explain the curriculum, uh, some of how it fits into the scope and sequence and whatnot. I'm going to be following questions and that type of thing. So if you have any questions, be sure to ask and uh, let us know you're here because uh, we love seeing your smiling faces. Okay. All right. Well, good morning. Um, I'm going to start off by explaining the sequence of our program and how it works because there's a lot of confusion out there and the confusion is more our fault rather than um, all, all of you. Uh, you have a right to be confused. Okay, so to start with, um, we have our Foundations Phonics, which was written by Carrie Linquist, who also happens to be our oldest daughter. And um, she did a fantastic job with this course. Um, it just, it really blew me away when I saw the finished product. It's, it's really amazing. And we're getting fantastic feedback on it. Now, children uh, vary widely in their abilities at the, especially in the, well, they, they vary widely across the board, but particularly when it comes to reading readiness. Some kids are ready at age three or four. Those are not the masses. Those are the exceptions. Um, usually between five and six, and sometimes as late as seven, eight, or nine is when they're really ready to begin reading. Now, the average, I would say, is going to be around six. So don't feel behind or feel stressed if your student just is not ready to start the the, the reading process. It's okay. It's a matter of development. And just like kids all learn to walk at different times, um, it's the same for, for reading readiness. And so for that reason, we have made this really flexible um, as to when you're going to start it and even how you're going to use it. Um, some children are really ready to start the reading process, but they're not quite ready to start writing. And so for those children, you can actually use it without using the writing component. And then it's a good idea to go back through to help them develop their um, hand strength and their stamina to go ahead when they're ready and start back uh, and go through it again. You don't have to do the whole program, just do the writing component and then it becomes a review. So it really doesn't hurt anything to do it that way. So you can use the Foundations Phonics as a full year um, kindergarten program. So if your child is ready to start doing phonics in kindergarten, go ahead and start it. But I would recommend you spread it out over the course of the year. Now, if you go ahead and do that, you would then use the basic language skills for first grade. And you would spread this out over the course of the school year. However, if your student isn't quite ready until first grade or so, um, we've made it so you can do this in half a year and do this in the second half of the year. So we really give flexibility and multiple scheduling so that you can do this in the way that um, makes the most sense for your student. Can I add a couple things and ask? Yes. Now, one of our, our students, it turned out to be one of the brightest stars. Yes. Right? didn't she wasn't ready to read more like seven or eight yeah well she really struggled and i have to tell you by the time she hit high school 
she's one of our best readers. She's mm -hmm. one of our best writers. She's fantastic. She's done fantastic. So really don't get scared for those late bloomers. You know, we really struggled with the whole reading till probably about fourth grade or so. It wasn't until after that, that it kicked in. And then it took a few more years for her to really regain her confidence because she felt like she didn't, she must not be smart, even though that was not at all the case. So phonics requires memorization skills. Yes. Because you have to be able to recall the last few numbers. And so we did some testing with her, not testing, but we would do reinforcements, giving her different number sequences. So we would say like four, seven, eight, right? And right. give her numbers back. What is the numbers? What? How many numbers do they say? Like, is it four numbers I that they should be able to say? I say it's four, but... Um, the idea behind that is that reading takes a lot of memory. And so, okay, they start off with a word. They have to remember all the sounds that the letters make. And then they start off, like if they're reading the word phonics, they have to remember, you know, pH. What sound does that make together? And then the O sound, the N, the I, the C, and the S. Now, by the time they get to the C and the S, some children don't have the memory um, ability to remember what they already read for the first part of the word. And that's what ours, that's where she was. She was right. having trouble with the memory. With the memory. And <laughs> so then think about it. Even if they're able to get it down for the word, they have to remember the beginning of the sentence that they just read in order, and the end, in order to put it all together for reading comprehension. So there's a lot of memory um, foundations that have to be laid in a student's uh, brain development. And so, yeah, you can, you can do the things like Randy mentioned of giving number sequences. You can give letter sequences. You can use... We did matching cards, flip cards. Yeah, the memory game, you can do that. Um, another thing that you can do that really helps with memory skills is giving the student tasks. And you can say, okay, go get me the apple that's on the kitchen table and have them bring it back. And then once they're able to successfully do that, you can tell them, okay, go get me a spoon out of the drawer and a glass that's on the counter or something, you know, make, you know, whatever is part of your daily routine. Sequences. Right. Sequences. And as they're able to do those things without an issue, then you will add another sequence. So those are just a handful of ideas that you can work on if your student isn't ready for reading and you have found that it's, um, could be related to, to um, memory. Okay, so I diverted, so go back. Yes, so um, so with basic, basic language skills, eventually this is going to become Language Lessons for a Living Education 1. Now that's not going to happen until probably mid to late 2019 or so. Um, but eventually it's going to match the style and the feel of language uh, lessons for living education, but we're going to try to keep as much of the content the same as possible. And so we'll probably thicken it up a little bit because right now it doesn't have all um, all of the components that um, the, sorry, the language nails, lessons for living education. Your fingernails are camouflaged. Oh, I'm so sorry. So they're into the thing. <laughs> uh, these fingernails are the um, gift from my daughter, Joy. She bought these nails and wanted me to have them for our special weekend. And so they're the, just the stick on kind of <laughs> falling off my stool. <laughs> I told you, we are really out of it today. So anyhow, for those of you that are waiting, are wondering, okay why does it start at um, level two it's because we actually did this because it was needed to follow up the phonics but then we got together and, and embarked on this uh, this whole series so we're gonna go backwards and we're going to get this to match this in style and feel and then in addition to that, we have our elementary Bible in English grammar. Now, this course was actually done first. And so um, we will also be put it, turning this into our language. I figure out which way to do this to put them both in. We're going to turn this 
no, this <laughs> into our language lessons for living education in style and feel. But again, still retain as much of the content as possible, you know, reordering some things, putting in probably some picture studies and some things like that. So that's um, how we got to where we are right now. So now I'm going to go through and talk about our language lessons for living education level two because we haven't done one of these since it's actually been available in print and we could actually hold one of these up, which is really fun. So um, how this is laid out. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this uh, particular part of it because you can go in and take a look at a nice variety of sample um, on our website. So we highly suggest that you um, do that, that you take a look at the sample on our website. But how it's laid out is every quarter there are five... <laughs> I can't keep my hand in the right place. There are five um, stories for every quarter. And in between those five stories are um, picture studies. Um, there's also a reading of a psalm. There's a poem. Um, and we do in every quarter. So every quarter we do five stories. That's nine weeks. Right. Okay. A quarter is nine mm -hmm. weeks. And we do, we do five stories. And in the stories we have highlighted uh, sentences. So if you're looking at the sample and you're wondering why are these sentences highlighted, those are suggestions for you to have your student read. Um, so it's a read, the stories are read together. So they're meant for the teacher and the student to sit down together and the, the um, teacher's going to read some of the story and the student's going to read some of the story. That brings the student in to the story, its ownership, and it makes for a more interesting story than see spot, see spot run. Um, you know, that's kind of dry and boring. And so we want students to be able to participate in something that is relatable to them and at their intellectual level, not simplified to below. Um, Carity says, can you show a sample? I sure can if I can find one. Right? Sure, on the first one. Oh, here we Yeah, that one's... I'll find one. You keep talking. Um, so, Randy's going to look for one. Okay, there we go. And so, you you notice in level two at the very beginning, there's just a few sentences that are highlighted. And they're only usually one or two syllable words as they're getting their, they're building up confidence. And so I really encourage you not to start off. You can do more than what we highlighted for the student whose um, abilities are beyond that. But don't get too excited too quick because you really want to build the student's confidence. Confidence is what we're really after at this level. Now, if you can find one at the end of the book to show how we gradually increase the number of um, sentences that the student's going to read. So by the time you get through level three, they're going to be reading a good chunk of the story. This is a psalm, actually. Oh, that's a psalm. So you can see they're, they're gradually increasing the amount of reading that they're going to do um, on any particular day. And like I said, you can have your student do more reading or less reading, but rather than just leave you to guess which sentences would be right for your student, we, we highlighted... Um, are suggested, but we totally expect you to develop it and to use it however it works best for you and your student. So by the end of level three, they'll be reading most of the story. By level four, they'll be reading the entire story um, for themselves. So level two, uh, Tiffany just asked, what grade is this for? This is for approximately second grade. But we do levels because we want you to tailor it to, the, to where your student's at and not worry so much about grade levels. Um, how we let, let me finish um, how it's structured and then we'll go to figuring out uh, where your student is. So 
we have two picture studies per quarter. One of them is going to, the first one's going to be based on a Bible story, and the second one's going to just be um, any kind of sweet um, picture. We've used a variety of mediums. Some may be a little more cartoonish. Some may be more a traditional, older uh, painting. Um, we wanted to represent a variety of things. Part of it is because we want to inspire in children the variety of things that are available for them to do. And so graphic design is part of our world nowadays. So we want to include some things that have a graphic design feel as well as the old time artistic uh, paintings and such. And so um, we've, we've just included a lot of variety. Now we've also included uh, a psalm and a poem. And again, the same thing. One's Bible related. One is very sweet and nice, but not necessarily, necessarily, you know, out of scripture. And so that's the structure of a quarter. Now within that, we have the days. And so on your first day, you're going to start off with that either um, picture study or reading your story or psalm, um, one of those things. And then there's usually some sort of activity to do um, with it as well. And in level two, that's the day that you're going to do a little bit of phonics review. Um, and then the next, the next day, um, you're going to study either like a punctuation type thing or a grammar type thing or calendar work, which is the case in this one, days of the week in the calendar. And then so day, let's see, so days of the week was day two, calendar work is day three. Sometimes it's going to focus more on um, grammar type things on day three. Now, day four is really unique and set apart in level two. We're going to do something a little different in level three. But in level two, um, level two and this one, let me see. This one is a little different, so let me get, get to want to a level four. Okay, that follows the correct thing. Okay, so level four is the day that, you, that your student is actually going to tell you a story. And we want... This is a communications course. And so in laying the foundations of communi communication, we want the student to be able to verbalize their stories because they have to be able to verbalize them before they're able to write them down. And students of this age, again, they, they really vary widely in their abilities to write, which is why we start off with the student only um, writing a, one sentence in a day, and by the end of the year they're up to being able to write up to three sentences in a day because we really want to develop the writing stamina um, and sometimes it's hand strength sometimes it's just uh, the ability to focus and to be able to get through uh, that writing process and it, it seems to be a little bit more of a struggle for boys and so that's why now if your student is a writer, then we encourage you to get them a journal, give them other writing opportunities. Um, that's completely fine, but we wanted it to be at a simpler level for those who really struggle at this point. And so especially for those who struggle, they get the opportunity to draw a picture on one side, and then on the other side, they get to write a sentence or two or three, depending on where they are in the course, um, about their story. And so they're able to first verbalize it, then they're able to think about it as they put it to print by drawing. And some, some kids are gonna love to draw and take forever, and some kids are just gonna wanna rush through it. Um, but it is a really important part of the process. Um, and then they're, gonna, then they're gonna write. Now, if your student writes a sentence and they're just exhausted, but they really want to say more. It's okay for the mom to go ahead and transcribe what the student has to say. In fact, in a lot, a lot of the course, there's um, extra space underneath um, on a lot of these pages. And so you can add to it for the student and just transcribe what they have to say about their story. And then what we've done is we've made this day so that it can actually be torn out. And so... 
if you pull this out, you can actually accumulate a whole year's worth of their stories that they can put in their own separate binder and they can keep and they can go back through and read about it um, over the summer and in the future and it becomes a little bit of, keep, of a keepsake for their year. And so that's the special thing about the fourth day. Now the fifth day of the year is going to focus on spelling. And so we put the spelling all on one day because I, I recognize that, you know, like we have a lot of kids that have dyslexia and they need some extra practice or you might have your own favorite spelling program. And so we did it all on one day so that if you needed to um, change it up a little bit or use a different program, that's okay. You know, we want it flexible. And so what we've done with our spelling is we have all different activities and what I did is I drew from a handful of activity types and then we change them up from week to week, but we go back to them. So there's repetition, but there's also variety because we don't want the kids to get bored. Um, I think you were one of those kids that would have gotten bored if we used the exact same type of uh, activity every single week. Possibly. <laughs> and so um, that's why we, we designed it the way that we did with the last day being spelling. Okay, so that's your basic rundown of how the course works. I just wanted to show you because I happened to flip when I was going through the spelling one of the sweet um, older fashion type images that we used for picture study. They're not all older fashion like this, but some are. And, uh, you know, they're just really sweet pictures like that for picture study. Um, and I just want to also um, talk a little bit, just briefly, about the questions. So for the picture studies, we have the um, observation questions, but also for the stories and the songs and all of them, we also have narration questions. And I know that the Charlotte Mason, the the pure... Um, the, the, the purest way would just be, okay, what was the story about? But the feedback that I get is that not all kids are ready just to spit back what they have heard. And so the questions are designed to cause the student to think a little bit about what they've heard and what types of things they should be listening for. So it's a gentle training. And so we want to teach them how to listen <laughs> this is as quiet as I've ever seen, Randy. <laughs> um, we want to teach them how to listen and what types of things that they should be listening for. And that's how we've designed the questions. And so if your student is, you know, leap years beyond and they're able just to tell you what the story is about with no prompting, then we suggest that you do that. Um, yeah, but a lot of students do need that extra bit of help. That's why we added the um, questions. So that's the semi-quick run through. We, what, what's not in those samples are the extra things in the back of the book. And for that, if I could to, touch on a couple things. Um, she just actually showed a picture of an older, it's an older picture and there's also incorporated newer pictures and stuff like that. Right. Um, sometimes when our kids will say, uh, you know, well, that's an old picture, I'm bored, or, or I don't, you know, it's nothing, it's not exciting to them. I think it's important to relate to them that we live in a world that has old and new, and that we have to be able to look at the old, find meaning, interpret it, and that's why I tell my kids all the time, when you look at me and you see the old, try to find meaning there, and then you have to look at the young and the new and those type of things, and um, encourage them that it's not just all about Minecraft. It's not all about what, you know, the, the exciting, the new, that type of thing. It's also about learning to look back and appreciate what once was modern and contemporary and that type of stuff. So I think that there's value in having both of those. Um, a question was asked about the translation that we used. In this, it was New American Standard. One of the things I would say especially when you're talking elementary students, King James Version is, is 12th grade comprehension. And so we understand a lot of families that appreciate one translation over another. Um, we, we 
we allow the authors with all of our materials to select the translation that they want. And we encourage families to cross-reference or use the, the additions, the, the translation that they're most interested in. But I would keep in mind that when you're working with Bible with children, um, that 12th grade comprehension, they may not get a lot out of it anyways at that level. And so um, New American Standard is what is in this, but we encourage you to do what's right. Uh, Go ahead. As far as rollouts, this year, of course, level two is available. Right. Level two is available right now. Level three, we're hoping by the end of August to be shipping that. So and it's ready to use in September. That's that's the plan. And then um, level four. Level four will be by the we're looking at by the end of the calendar year of this year. And then level five will roll out next spring sometime. Hopefully before convention season, which would be right. March. And then we'll devote the remaining of next year, bringing up to date the Bible and English grammar and the basic language skills. We'll probably start with the basic language skills um, when we do that. So I wanted to show, while, while you're talking here, I've been flipping, just to show some examples of a, of a newer, of a newer um, type. And then we have this one that's actually, we also tried to use some of the images that come from our other books, some that have been used, um, used by us to showcase some of the beautiful things that we have in some of our, in some of our books. And then some of our activities, you know, have more modern type looking images. Okay, so, uh, yeah, it's a combination of both. Now, something that isn't in the sample that this is the meat of what I really want to get into today um, is in the back of the book. And, and because I had this all prepared to go over with uh, at home and I accidentally grabbed the wrong book, I had everything all sticky tab. So you're going to bear with me um, jumping. Okay. So, oh, and just for, just to, to point out, when people are talking about the boxes, this is, uh, that's really good for just students who have dyslexia. This is what I believe they're referring to. There's, um, you know, a bunch of the spelling activities that utilize um, this approach. And a few moments ago, we just reviewed um, a file that Carrie uh, Bailey had given yes. us about dyslexic students compared with teaching methods. Right. And so, yeah, that was really great. We're going to upload that so that parents mm -hmm. who have children study struggling with dyslexia can see how this would fit. So, right. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about assessment. So at this grade level, um, for me personally, um, I would not, I would just use it and I would just have an idea of how my student um, is doing without feeling the need to do additional assessments. However, we also lived in the state of New York prior to moving here. And in New York, I had to have assessments um, due to the laws there. I needed grades, I needed all that. And if anything was ever questioned, I would have needed something to kind of back that up with. So, um, we have provided two different ways to do an assessment. First of all, we go, go over how to do the grading when you do the assessments. Um, you know, like what does an A mean? What does a B mean? That sort of thing. So if you want, you could just use that page that does the guidelines. Um, so an A, the student shows complete mastery of the concepts with no errors. B, the student shows mastery with minimal and so on and so forth. So if you just needed a quick guide, you could just use that. Then we do uh, put together a chart, and this is similar, not exactly, but similar to what's in our writing strands, where there's the ability for the teacher to select either the skills, the skill is mastered or they need experience. And this is actually really helpful if you need at the end of the year to just go back or at the end of a quarter to go back and review some things. That's a great way to track because um, if you're like me, you'll think you remember. And then when the time comes to go back and look at it again, you've forgotten. So that's a really good way. And then we have your traditional quizzes. Um, I would use this, these quizzes as a last resort at this age, but 
when I was in New York, I would have had to have used this. And it's completely up to you whether or not you want to help them with the, um, with the quizzes, if you want to make them do it on their own, if you allow them to look back or not, um, which would be called an open book quiz. That's completely up to you. Um, but if you just want to really see what your child can do completely on their own, you can also do that. So those are the quizzes. There's four quick quizzes, one quiz per quarter. Okay, so then we come up to our independent reading list. So every so many lessons, there's going to be indep an independent reading um, assignment. And what we want is for the parent to select a book that is at their student's reading level. Because children are so different in their reading abilities at this, um, at this level. Like I had second graders that really struggled with reading, and I had second graders that could read at a high school level. So this allows the teacher to assign a book that is appropriate for their student. Now, you may want to do like um, we did here, where you sit down and you read the, the book together, where the student does, um, you know, read some of the sentences, you read some of the sentences. Um, you may want to have the student read aloud to you. Some uh, students will be ready for independent reading, and they can just go off and read it on their own. They are so different at this level in their abilities. So we want you to design a program that works for your child, not what I've decided a second grader um, should be reading at that point. So first of all, we have a, a reading list that you can keep track of what your child has read that's really good for meeting state requirements um, and just to track of you know a source of accomplishment um, for your student at the end of the year to say wow look at all the books that you've read and you know you could even set up a reward if you want um, for all their hard work in addition to that we also give a list of books by grade level ranges they are not put in any particular order, and you, so you'll want to really, oh, Carity, is anybody else locked up other than Carity? Um, let us know if you're still seeing us. Um, and so having the, the ranges, you can go through and pick out topically what your student might be interested in um, based on, on these ranges. And those are master books. Yes, yeah, so those are master book titles, right. Now, we also have the Create Your Own Dictionary. Now, right now, we have the generics in the back, and Josh is going to be uploading a, the free sample of these so you can print them yourself. But um, Design is also going to do a full dictionary with the letters, you know, for each page. Um, on there, similar to the one that's in basic lang language skills. Let me show you that one. Um, similar to this, but just with a, you know smaller lines and all of that for a second grade student. We haven't gotten to that yet. Right now, we just have the blank master because we're working so hard on level three to get that out. But Josh will put this up um, to give you all so you can print it um, right right off That'll be from on the a product file. page and right. we'll, we'll upload it here in the group as well okay <clears throat> i think the spelling list sheet too i only saw one to create your own spelling list okay so uh randy may look through it if you all want you can always um start a new post and uh if somebody wants to start it and just say hey these are some things we'd like to be able to have as a free download when we're working through this course. Right. Okay, so next we have the activities and games section. Now I will read off the list of what you, you're gonna wanna ha have on hand for supplies. Index cards, markers, crayons, stickers, etc. Three hole punch and rings or clips to st store your um, index cards, which is optional. Okay, so we have the alphabet memory matching game, and then we have it uh, how to play it one way, how to do it more challenging, and how to add variation within the games. We have I Spy. 
not only do we have the games and how to play them, but we also tell you exactly, uh, let's see, nouns, adjectives, and observation for I spy. Those are the things that if you want to add dimension to your day, if your student needs extra practice, if their learning style tends to be more hands-on, you're going to want to do these. Now, we didn't include them in the lesson themselves because as a mom, I know what it's like to be exhausted and my student that day really wants to play I Spy. So we put them in the back of the book and we put them in the order that these topics are, um, are covered in the course so that you can do them when it works for you and your schedule and your family. So we have quite a few of these games, action verbs, charades, uh, fun with sentences drawing game, don't let make me laugh word game synonym story game that you can also use with antonyms homophones and homonyms good job yeah um okay so then the next section is all just on spelling so the other games cover um cover different types of things this is specifically for spelling now i'm going to tell you my approach to spelling and how i view it your kid, or my kids anyway, I can't speak for you, yours, but my kids came out of the womb either good spellers or not good spellers. I have tested this theory. I have used the exact same curriculum, the exact th same everything, and I have come out with kids that could spell anything and everything. I don't even know how they knew how to spell these words to kids that have just struggled terribly with spelling. And so for the kids that struggle with spelling, lots of repetition, using them in their work, having them correct their spelling, not in all their work. If they're writing for fun and doing journals, don't ruin their um, enjoyment of writing by making them correct all of their spelling that's done, especially for fun. Um, and so I put together um, a lot of ways that you can practice your spelling, um, different games and things like that that you can do to um, have a more hands-on approach to the spelling in addition to the spelling lessons. Um, we also included, this is what Randy was talking about, the spelling list where they can write their words um, that they're struggling with. I don't suggest that they write the words that they've already mastered if they want, if you want extra practice. But we have given this so that um, you can either tuck it in to a, um, the plastic pages and use the dry erase uh, markers or laminate them, or you can print off extra copies. And so we will put that in with the dictionary as a downloadable resource so that you can just print off more pages if you want them. The other thing that we have done is we've included all of the spelling words in the back of the book by lesson. And so you can use this in a variety of ways. You can use it when you're um, playing the games and doing extra activities with the spelling. You can use it as a checkoff list. And so, okay, my kid has this down, and then you know the ones that they need to work on. So we've just included it as just another resource that you can just use for however it works best for your family. Now we also include the master list of sight words. And so this is something that you're gonna spend several weeks going over. And again, you can use this master list as a checkoff um, or you can use it, you know, when you're playing games and such um, and doing activities. I would probably use it to check off the ones that they've, that they've mastered because who wants to keep going back over and over and over words that the kid already has down? The kid sure doesn't. My kids sure didn't. I, I wouldn't have wanted to. And so um, that's just a really good tool. So some kids at this level are still needing alphabet practice. But why make every kid doing this book practice their alphabet if they've already got it down? So we gave the resource in the back of the book um, with their alphabet practice for those who need it. 
Now we also go into more copy work practice. Now the copy work is based on their vowels, what a noun is, what a proper noun is, what singular means. So these are some basic concepts that kids of this, this age may struggle a little bit with, and you wouldn't have to necessarily use them all, but it's just another resource. You wouldn't have to use any if you don't want to, but it's a resource that you can use as they go through the course to reinforce some of the key concepts. So there's quite a bit. There's, um, you know, this is the second part of the page of your abbreviations, of your months. Um, here's your number words. So there's just all sorts of things in the back here that they can use for um, practice. Now we also have a section of study sheets. Now this is the calendar. What I would probably do with these study sheets is I would probably pull them out and put them in, a, in my student's binder. Um, so we have possessive nouns and compound nouns, and all they are is they're actual duplications of this information from their lesson. But it, in the end, as, as you go over them, you can pull them out, put them in the binder, and then when they get confused by something, they have something that they can reference. Like, for instance, if they get stuck, they don't know how to, they're not sure when to use eat, ate, or eaten, they can look it up in the, in the back of their book. So they're just kind of cheat sheets and uh, ways that you can sit down with your student and just reinforce practice. Um, yeah, Bailey says, uh, Sorry, Carrie Bailey says you can do index cards with the words, make two per word, cut one up so they can build the word back, like matching. That's a, a perfect um, a perfect way to use this. In fact, over time, I really think it would be great if um, some of our moderator moms uh, put together a list of ideas that the moms share of how to use all these things in the back of the book. Okay. Now that we've gotten through that, we've come to the final component, which is the answer key, yay! Now, um, we've had some people comment when they've looked at our, um, and I just opened to a perfect example. When, they, when they've looked at our thing, they've said, well, that's kind of strange because there's only one question, but it has an, a, a, a one on it. You know, why bother number it if there's only one question on that page? Well, here's something that moms are really going to want to know about this book. We only numbered the problems that have an answer in the back of the book. And so you are not going to have to keep checking in the back of the book wondering if there's an actual answer. Now, it's silly for us to put copy work in the back of the book. We also can't really give an answer, say, on those pages where the student is writing a sentence about the story. We don't know what sentence the student's going to create. Mm -hmm. So those questions don't have answers in the back of the book. But all of the ones that are numbered, other than the narration ones, I'm not sure if we use numbers for those or not. We might have. Um, yeah, these are the only exception. Under narration practice, there are no answers in the back of the book for those. Um, because they're writing the story. So um, that's how you're going to know whether or not to look in the back of the book for an answer. So the last hundred pages of this book essentially are manipulatives, games, uh, right. extra practice sheets. Um, I mean, right. this book is, we don't like the word evolution typically, but this book is a product of five very intense years of developing curriculum, getting customer feedback, and building a product that... And um, oh, yeah, is, and over 20 years of right. my own frustrations, because if anybody were to ask me, um, what would you recommend? I've never found a language arts program that I liked. We've sold all the majors. Yes. And we've worked with all the majors and the minors. Yes. So this is kind of the best of where yep. we've taken pieces from the curriculums that we've enjoyed using, what we saw working with our kids, giving right. enough options so that other families it was easy enough to implement. Right. Um, a couple of uh, quick things. If you, somebody asked if they ordered this now with their, with the rest of the order, would it, the whole order ship when it comes available? No, we would back order this. 
for level three. For level three. If you ordered level two, it would ship, um, and they would ship the rest of your order. Then when level three comes in, they would ship that. Uh, occasionally, if there's like a couple of days or a week's time between when we're expecting it in, that'll happen. But typically, um, we want to get your books to you as quick as possible. Uh, Karen just asked, are the other levels going to have similar things in the back of the book as well? Yes. Um, all of the other books will also have, um, like for level three, we'll probably pull out the alphabet, um, at least in the copy work part of it, we'll probably put an alphabet in so that they can review it because there are still some kids even going into fifth grade that have forgotten their alphabet. That, right. That happens, doesn't it? Yeah. So I was in fifth grade <laughs> and we had to do the dictionary, you know, and up till that time, you always had the cheat sheet sheet of all the alphabet across the top of your desk, and they made a switch desks. And apparently, the other kids didn't need the cheat strip, and so they realized that I had not taken the time to memorize my alphabet in fifth grade because it happened. You didn't really need it. <laughs> I didn't need it obviously until that moment. So um, yeah, so it does happen. Yeah. Yeah, so um, we will amend it. Some of the activities are going to overlap. Um, and then, you know, so, but we're going to tailor them to each level. Now, what I would, we would suggest level two is for a student going into second grade. But how I would approach deciding whether um, my student was ready for level two or level three would be on their ability to write. So if they can write a sentence without it being a major fatigue issue or, you know, it being really difficult, um, then they're, they're ready to go into level two. If they can write already three, four sentences, then they're probably ready for level three. Mm -hmm. If they can't write a sentence, I would probably go back and do some more practice in the basic language skills. Even if you just go through it really fast, um, you're going to want to just build up that hand strength and that ability um, to write a sentence. But so a student who is just about to the level. I mean, if they're able to almost write a full sentence, they're probably ready to go into level two. If they can already write uh, three or four sentences or two or three, you can put them into level three. So it's really their sentence, their ability to write a sentence. Level three is going to start off with them writing two sentences in a day and build it all the way up to four to five. And so that's really where the kid's stamina comes in. We are going to... Um, there's phonics covered in level two. That's not covered so much in level three. By the time third grade hits, the kids usually have a pretty good uh, foundation. So if they need some of the phonics review for the trickier things, um, then again, I would go with level two. If they're great on all of that, then go ahead and put them into level three. Um, they're still going to learn about nouns and verbs. We're going to add adverbs and some other things like that into level three that are not in level two. Um, and we, it is a gentle um, course. And so you may find that other courses cover a lot more intensely some of these grammar type things. But our goal is to for the kids to learn to communicate and to enjoy the process. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's why we've made it a more gentle approach because eventually they're going to, you could not teach any of it until high school and then cover grammar. So I don't see the reason to make it really painful. And so that's the goal of it. Somebody asked about how much time each lesson would take a day. 20 to 30 minutes is what we have five days a week. Right. And sometimes you're going to zoom through it quicker, and sometimes it's going to take you a little longer. Um, some of it's going to depend if you add on some of the other games in the back, extra practice, extra copy work. But we really don't want it to go much beyond 20, 30 minutes. Um, especially at, at this at this age and the other thing that I would like to say is that if your student starts off struggling with some of the writing it's okay to pull back a little bit um, let them do answer some things orally if they need to as they're building up um, their their strength and stamina now we say homeschooling for the real world and one of the things that if I 
wish we could do is eliminate the altogether number references. Right. But we know we do have to have them because it does help, but generically. But we've had students who were ready to read at four years old, watched a video and started reading. We've had students at eight years old struggling to learn how to read. They all ended up in the same place. Right. And and so this, if your student has had no formal language, no formal grammar, um, and you're in third grade, you could easily right. do this. Fourth right. grade? Oh, sure. Yeah, because Jessica, I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name, Ogilvy, she asked if they're reading at maybe a third or fourth grade level, but writing more at a second grade level, would you keep them at level two? I would. Um, what I would do is when it comes to reading the stories, I would have them read more or all of the stories. And for their independent reading, I would pick out books that are at their um, reading level. But this is going to keep them at their writing level because so many kids hate to write. And it's because we push them too hard, too fast beyond their ability. And they haven't built that stamina up. And so it's just so important not to kill their desire to communicate through writing. And communicating through writing can be drawing, it can be writing sentences, but we do have to teach them how to express themselves through the written language. Mm -hmm. And so that's the end goal. The process, we don't want to, you know, kill the desire. Right. Okay. So one last thing, because we've we're, we've gone yeah, long. we've gone way over. Um, fifth grade, sixth grade. We have a lot of discussion about that mm -hmm. going on. We have the elementary Bible and English grammar, which is a great right. grammar course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This goes into a little more grammar, but again, the grammar is done in a practical way where they're applying it, not just learning it abstractly. Right. A lot of people have used this. This has been out for a few years. It's been mm -hmm. highly rated. It's one of our best-selling um, curriculum mm -hmm. sets. So this is definitely not a um, compromise, if you will. This is one that we highly recommend to people to use. Mm -hmm. has the faith-based component. Some people will modify the daily schedule a little bit to fit right. theirs. But still, this would be perfect for fifth, sixth grade. The other one is writing strands. Mm -hmm. The new writing strands would be ideal for a fifth grader to start. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a placement test, and there was some discussion earlier about the importance of you doing the placement test to kind of get a feel, to make sure it's challenging enough or it covers enough of the information. Right. What I would probably do if I'm trying to decide between the two is I would really, um, I, I would take a sample, I would open up a sample side by side and show my student both of them and let them do what they think. Um, they would be the most interested in doing. There's enough of a preview on our website that you could easily get a couple pages and put it in front of the student and mm -hmm. say, let's, here's two, let's try it. Um, something else in a lot of our previews, like you'll see course objectives, which is this one. Part. There's, there they are. It's right here. Okay. So this one doesn't have the table of contents in it yet. Yeah, that one will when it gets updated. Okay. We'll have a table of contents. So a lot of times in the Carity, preview. Though, Carity may have done a, um, a contest. Uh, content on this. Mm -hmm. So we definitely, if you're in, if you're in fifth, sixth grade, uh, this would be ideal to do as a grammar course right now. Mm -hmm. And the, the Bible component of it is just fascinating. Uh, the book mm -hmm. is fascinating. The, the facts that they're learning are fascinating. So I would highly recommend if you're waiting for um, language lessons for living education five or six to come out to, to use this. Yeah. And we've had some people say, well, um, that's a Bible story book. Um, is it going to be too little kiddish for my fifth or sixth grader? Absolutely not. The content that's, that's in this is really phenomenal. And it really, the content draws the kids in. They really like it. That's been the feedback that we've gotten. And there is a scope and sequence Carrie says in the file section for that course. So I think we covered a lot of it. Um, I know grade ranges are a little bit confusing for a lot of people the way we do it. We are going to be doing some videos to post on the website that helps clarify that a bit. Uh, 
again, we love seeing the excitement of box openings and the kids' excitement with the books. Uh, we love the hashtag Master Books in Action pictures. We encourage you to please continue posting those. We pass those around here. We talk about them all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to be using some of them in the marketing. We've got a catalog coming out. Some of the pictures we're actually going to be posting uh, some Master Books in Action shots in that catalog, so we highly encourage you to do that. And um, sorry about the technical difficulties earlier, but... Uh, Jennifer just asked if it includes spelling. It does. We've covered that earlier in the video. So if you want to go does back. Does the language skills include Oh, spelling? does the language, um, the language skills? She just says, does it. So the elementary Bible and Eng English grammar has vocabulary words, not specifically spelling. We'll be adding spelling to it when we redo it, um, you know, later next year. Um, same with the basic language skills. Um, they, there is a spelling component through the Create Your Own Dictionary um, in the basic language skills. Good. So um, it does not cover, uh, we do get asked a lot if it covers handwriting. It does not specifically have a handwriting course. There is copy work and some things like that that can help with their handwriting. Um, and we recommend that they do copy work of scripture for their handwriting. Um, and it is on our list of possibilities for developing an actual handwriting course in the future. Awesome. Yes, Abby said, my eight-year-old did two exercises in language lessons today without a single complaint, which is huge for him. Those comments really help us because as we're developing ways to begin marketing and that type of thing, hearing what your feedback is really helps us. So if some of you have gotten language lessons in and you're beginning to do it. Uh, if you go into Moms and Books and you post comments uh, about what your students are finding, even if they're not always happy um, and constructive, we, we look at ways, because sometimes what we found, like with math lessons, was people were having this one complaint and we realized they were coming from a particular curriculum and right. we just needed to provide some more instruction mm -hmm. so that they understood it and the way the complaint went away. So um, right. we, we really value all the feedback we get from you guys. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. We pray that you have a blessed day. We pray for your homeschool. Um, we, it is an honor and a privilege to serve you. Absolutely. Absolutely. God bless everybody. <laughs>